with you in the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers. I'm going to read from verse 30 through verse 32. Verse 30 through verse 32. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went, with up, went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. We were grasshoppers in their sight, and in our sight also. I believe that the church has reached perhaps its finest hour, but I don't believe it's ever faced a situation that it faces today. I'm going to deal with some of the things that I believe are the problem that we must face. But to face those problems demands that we have the proper perspective, that we look at things right. Now, everything God says to us is in the context that you're living right. I want to settle that with you. I'm not talking about sinners or quasi-Christians. I'm saying that whatever God says to us, He speaks to us, on the grounds he takes it for granted that you're walking with himself, that you're right before God. Now the psalmist declared, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. This was a cry of the psalmist. Now, when you look into human nature, once trouble gets into the heart, it seems to be our habit to blow them far out of proportion. We come to a place that is the very nature of the human being to get his eyes on the trouble and not upon the answer, not upon God. Our world begins to shrink and immediately we withdraw, whether this be in the church, when the church faces those seemingly unsurmountable situations, then there comes this shrinking back and a drawing back and saying that we just can't do this. There's too much it confronts us. Our world begins to shrink. We begin to look at our troubles and not look at God. And once that begins to happen, unless that can be reversed, hell is going to defeat us. Now look at the children of Israel. The twelve spies reported. Here was their report. We became like grasshoppers in our sight, and so we were in their sight. Now this was a viewpoint of them. They had a grasshopper mentality. Of course they were giants. They were problems. But God's Word had said to them, I am going to give you this land. He never said, if you can defeat the giants, I'm going to give you the land. He said, I am going to give you a land that flows with milk and honey. It wasn't a situation that if you can do this or do that, but God is saying to them, Amen, I have given you this land. Now, the cause of this mentality was the poor eyesight. I mean this. They were looking at themselves instead of looking at God. Their whole vision was toward themselves. Ten spies saw their situation in the land as a greater problem than it was. They saw their own position under God as smaller than it really was, and the two always go together. Now, if you see your problem as being bigger than they are, It'll go along with it. You're going to see God less than He is. And when that happens to you, you are in trouble. This is, this is what I'm saying, the right and the wrong perspective. I must look through the eyes of God. The church is in a world that's in trouble, and we are to face up to these problems. Amen. We are to bring people out of the situation that they're in. We have the answer. Now, God's Word provides the only true perspective.
There's no other place to look. You look at the situation. You try to settle it in the political arena. You think that if we can get enough people in public office, if you're looking at it in any direction other than the direction of the Word of God, then you're wrong. Now, number one, I want to deal with the definition of this grasshopper theology. But it, it is an accommodation to the circumstances. This, this thought that we're grasshoppers, this is a theology of man. It's always this way. Amen. They view it, it, there is an accommodation to the circumstances, to the giants, and usually to the impossibility of the tasks that set before us. This is what's robbed us. Let me tell you, there's no problem in this golden triangle we can't confront. There's no victory we can't win win. There's no power we cannot overcome if we look through God's eyes. If we see as God sees and we have the word of the Lord. Now when our problems tend to overwhelm us and we begin to look, we begin to look at the circumstances and that Theology that accommodates itself to the circumstances is certainly going to devour us. When if, that, that is, this grasshopper theology prevails, then those people that it prevails in begin to oppose everybody that believes we can move on. It's always this way. Once you are bought up into this situation and your thinking accommodates itself to the circumstances, then you're going to be angry. Listen to me, will you? Look up this way. Don't just do your studying after a while. Let me tell you. I, I want to tell you something this morning. This church, this church, I'm not talking about the world church or the universal body of Christ. I'm talking about us this morning. If we allow the unemployment and the situations in this community to stop us from believing God, then we're already defeat, defeated. And let some of us, let that mentality, theology prevail. Let that prevail and we'll become critical of those that don't believe it. Now the way in which we view a given situation will affect our perspective on everything around it. Ourselves and God included. Can you say amen? The way we view a situation will affect our perspective of ourselves and of God. We'll begin to whine and cry and believe that we can. But I want to say to you that whatever is taking place in this world has the permission of the Almighty. He doesn't have any blind side. Amen. There are no second causes. That devil is not a master. He's a servant. And if he's at work, it's because God let him work. I'm not a victim of circumstances. I'm not a victim of anything. I am a child of God. That must be my perspective. In the end, I've read it all. Amen. Not near enough, but I've read it all the way. In the end, the children of God are going to overcome the children of men. The victory is as sure as God is. I belong to God. I do not know what I'll have to pass through to get there, but I'm going to tell you this morning I'm going to get there. I said, I'm going to get there. I'm going to hang on, hold on, believe on, walk on, look at God. Not look at the situation about us, but look to God. Whatever, however we view that situation will affect our perspective of everything, ourselves and God. We all need, listen to me, we all need a, a, new, uh, a new perspective. Amen. We need it. We need a new and more perspective. A mature perspective on what's going on in the church today in the light of, of God's purpose, not in the light of what you believe. I look, some of the biggest names in, in the Pentecostal area are falling into the impact of immorality. Amen. You see some of the biggest names, amen, the headlines are, are hitting that there's adultery and been going on in some of them for years. Amen. I know when that happens, I talked to a young preacher. He was crushed. He said to me, what are we going to do? I said, get our eyes off of that and thank God that he let that corruption be exposed. Amen. Everything's working for good. That church can't go on with Ananias and Sapphira lying in its altar and God can't move with the adulterous and adulterous
daughter in the pulpit. Everything's working for the good. The church is going to win. I must see that. I can't look at every little detail in between. There's going to come. There's going to be those that look good, work good, fall down. But I got to keep walking. I got to step on top of the debris. Amen. I, we need a more mature perspective, ladies and gentlemen, as to what's going on in the church today. There's a purging taking place. There's a eyes being opened that everything that glitters isn't gold. God is making a revelation to you and I, and we let him. I know some of you, listen, you, you're darting around listening to about everything. But if you let God, He's going to make you understand that there's more of an apostasy out there than anything else just because it's big. Amen. There's all kinds of things. And God in His church is dealing with that real church, making us aware of the thing that's going on. Now, the grasshopper theology, as I said, is an accommodation to circumstances. Perspective, that's a capacity to see, flow, and work with the overall current in history and to understand that it all somehow relates to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I must. The, the right perspective is to be able to flow with the thing that's going on in history, the current history, and to know that somehow all of it relates to the church, the body of Christ, because history absolutely has no meaning apart from that. Amen. God is gathering a bride for His Son. That's what it's all about. Now the squeeze and the pressure, the upheavals like in Egypt, is that God has a people here that He wants out. Some of them don't want out. But he's going to shake up their world where there's more to life than a new car and a television set. My God, people, we've got to see that there's better things in eternity, that this world's not our home. We must come to realize once more that it's not this earth, but it's coming up in eternity. We're so caught up in things that people are not excited about heaven and eternity anymore. The rapture of the church. I heard a man preaching. He said Christ was no fool. Amen. He said he's not going to move the church out at a time when it's doing more than it ever did. Oh, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There had never been a time when more people were lost, being lost, deceived, and being deceived than it is in this hour. But yet, there is an awakening, a disturbing among the real church of God, pulling them back to an altar to look at God and to look at things to God. Amen. Uh, the opposite, uh, it, it, this, this right perspective is the opposite of this grasshopper mentality. We're not someday going to be victorious. We're victorious now. Amen. You hear me? I said we're victorious now. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but I can tell you now I know what we're going to be like because we're going to be like Him. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I'm not going to get in Him one day. I'm in Him now. And if I stay there, God looks at me as already like Christ is. He's working on us. I said He's working on us. From this standpoint, but yet, oh, hallelujah, ability to lose our battle and to know we haven't lost the war is the right perspective. I lost a lot of battles, but I haven't lost the war. <laughs> I said God hadn't lost the war. He never lost the battle. I lost a few foreign. You lost a few foreign. You've been led out into the desert land of a lot of things, thinking God was there. The enemy sell you a lot of notions. Amen. You lost maybe a battle, but we must know that just losing a battle doesn't mean we've lost the war. Amen. Any given place, we can get up and move on with God. This is the key. I said, this is the key to all. A dose of God's sovereignty, which believes that God intends to do what He said and will do and has the ability to move history in the direction that He 
in 10, according to Ephesians 1 and 10, is the right perspective. I look at things, somebody said it's all over with. Amen. Trouble is everywhere. Nothing on the horizon to see to turn it around. Well, I can tell you here now, if there's any time to turn it around, God will turn it around. If it isn't any time, we're going to get out of here. My only course of life is to walk with God and be thankful in every situation of life, knowing that the will of God is being worked out on this earth in everything. He sets over the nations whomsoever He will. God Almighty directs the ballot box, the coups, and everything else. God is in charge. I said He's never abdicated. John in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation says, or the 6th chapter, I believe in the 19th verse, said, The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah. He's looking at a world in tribulation. He's looking at hell everywhere. But he said, God is in control. That's a perspective that must grip the human heart. Amen. The future. We must, we must have, know, and see the future in the declared purpose of God. And it must be greater and more meaningful than the present. The mark of a true believer is that person that's willing to sacrifice the present for the future. That sees, thank God in the plan of God, it ain't going to do nothing but get better for me. Amen. I may be passing through a storm. There's on every side, there's difficulties. But I'm moving toward the God-given goal of my life. I'm going to sit on the throne of this universe. I'm going to be there with Him with a glorified body, with the mind of God, knowing as I'm known. That's not knowing my grandma. I don't know whether we'll know each other like that or not. I guess we will. But I'm, I, we're not going to be married up there. We're all going to be a family up there. Amen. But when He said we'll know as we are known, that just simply says, I'll know like God knows. It won't be labors of learning. I won't have to study. I'll know like God knows in that day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's answer, listen, God's answer to the whole thing is believers filled with the Holy Ghost. I said God's answer in our time is believers filled with the Holy Spirit on this earth. Not, not imitation, but full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Listen, believers filled with the Holy Spirit, growing and taking on their true perspective. That is, seeing history, the church and the future, and themselves as God sees it all. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Seeing it like God sees it. Don't look at the church like a man will look at it. They say it's divided, over with. I'm telling you, it's about to get up out of ashes. Thank, I'm telling you, it's going to be heard like it hasn't been heard since the second chapter of the book of Acts. Amen. The world says we're no longer a force. We're about to become a force. I'm not talking about numerically. I'm talking about full of the Holy Ghost. God living through us. Hallelujah on this earth. That's the answer to things. Not me having a better job, not having more money, but being full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Being full of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh, listen. When you realize that, and I want to talk to you, the problems faced by the believer and the church that must be overcome. You know, if you look at them, I'm just going to cite you some of them here this morning. They all, all copied out here. Now, I want to tell you something. When you look at what we're facing today, there has to come, I said there has to come into that heart a perspective that doesn't see what the world's seeing. Amen. Doesn't see what the world, if they told you what they see, amen, your heart would fail you for fear of the things that's coming. I mean, in the world of disease, in the world of war, and the things that's happening out there, if you and I knew those things, amen, if we didn't see God in it all, amen, our hearts would fail us. And if we don't have the per per perspective, amen, that God would have us, that through the sovereign Word of God, I look at things like God looks at them, and no matter what's taking place on this earth, somehow it's working out for that church to be what it's supposed to be. I moved through Eastern Europe. I moved through Eastern Europe. All of them under communism. I talked to some of the greatest men of God I've ever met. Spent more time in jail than some 
some of you have been alive. They never, they never browbeaten. They're not saying we've had it bad. They're saying God allowed this dictatorship to come through here to break the back of false religion. We are bound by the darkness of religion. And just like God let Nebuchadnezzar sack Jerusalem, he got a lot of Nebuchadnezzars out there. I said he got a lot of them out there. Troubles. Listen, I want to recite some of the problems that I feel we, the church, and, uh, must come to, that comes to us. I recite these. I want to challenge you with me of where we stand, what the task is, what the reality of that task is, how that that must be faced. I said how that that must be faced. We face an epidemic world. For instance, our own American society of drug abuse that reaches to our grade schools and all the way to Congress. We face a world of school addiction where they tell us seven out of ten families in America are tainted and hurt with all of the massive problems associated with this problem. The rise of crime that's jammed our prisons, our penitentiaries, where we warehouse men and women year after year only to have them back again in our prisons. The medical world has been able to some degree to empty a hospital. I don't know how it's about, but the ad Advertising now, they used to not have to do that, but big signs on the buses advertising hospitals and what have you, on the, but our prisons are jammed to the door. Immorality that's openly flaunted in every room, living room, prime time, prime pretty color. Our families are threatened with the humanist without and the liberal preacher within. Within our ranks who walks, there are those that walk on to Christian talk shows to introduce his new wife of six weeks when only a few months before the audience was seeing the same man present his lovely wife wife of a few months before. One of the challenges of the problem of our time is the man and the woman in our church who views the Christian television, sees a parade of personality who try to go home and struggle to make his marriage work when seemingly big religious leaders just change theirs at will. I'm telling you that's a problem of the church. It's a problem that a face in Africa that's a problem you face around the world when a lot of highly successful preachers believe that they can just dismiss a wife and pick up another. I'm going to tell you, it don't work that way. Well, the most challenging problem to face the church both now and certainly in the future is a killer disease that's abroad in the land called AIDS. A disease that had its origin among the apes of Africa and through sexual bestiality has entered the human race through the homosexual practice. This killer disease, they tell us, can hide in human cells five to six years and surface and kill. Well, what about the promiscuous convert who comes into our church during these days of revival to sing in our choir to marry our young people? What about who the man, the woman whose husband is promiscuous, the unsaved husband who cavorts with the prostitute who are now tested to be over 50% carriers in America of this deadly disease and during the disease bringing the disease home to the family. Those who specialize in infectious disease tell us there's no solution in sight for this disease. They estimate that eventually, actually, it may eventually bankrupt the medical community of America. Then there's the vicious crimes of our time, the murdering of unborn babies through abortion, all of this. Let me tell you, I just say this to you to tell you the problems that the church confronts. We can crawl into a corner, hide our head, and say it's no use, but I'm telling you, we're well able to take the land. We're more than conquerors in Christ. There's no hell that we face if we see God in it all. Our perspective must be right. I must look at these things. I know they're bad. I don't minimize nothing, but I'm telling you that you and I are not to be stopped by a giant in the way. I may look like a grasshopper to him. Hey, listen, he looks like no giant to me. 
Amen. And I'm not looking at myself as no grasshopper. I'm not an orphan. I'm not a victim. I'm not been deposited on nobody's doorstep. I'm here in the will of God. I'm in Beaumont because the cloud led me here. I'm here in this pulpit now because of the will of God. Sure, there's problems, but we're well able to take the land. Hallelujah to God. We must know that. We must believe that. Our minds must be washed of the trash of that politics that preaches no hope. Amen. That, that theory that came in during the Carter administration that we're living in a declining universe. Oh, no, ladies and gentlemen. They're finding new worlds out there all the time. God's the creator. I said, God's a creator. We're made in the image of God. That means we're creators. Hallelujah. I don't mean we're gods, but I mean God through us brings new creatures into being. I don't want to get caught up with none of them folks talking about their little gods. I'm not. I mean, I'm telling you, though, that the church is that vehicle of expression. It is through us that God lives. It is through us that God challenges those giants. Hallelujah. When David, with a slingshot, amen, rose up and murdered that giant, giant, pulled his own sword out, cut his head off, and held that head up in the air with the blood dripping from it. The Philistines are hunting something to hide in. Amen. They saw the best of it put down. But Israel rose up out of the trenches to shout. I'm telling you, church, there's giants out there that challenge us. And don't you ever forget who they're challenging. They're not challenging the Reagan administration. They're not challenging the Soviet system. They're challenging the living God. God. I said they're challenging the living God. Are we or are we not capable? Can we represent God? Do we have the authority of God? Are we the people of God? I'm telling you, that's where we are. That's where we are. Make up our mind. Do we belong here or not? If we belong here, let's get about this business. Perspective. We face, we face the problems of a society broke loose from the basic restraint of God in His Word and a liberal church that says we're not to mention these things. We're faced with a pulpit that's frightened to talk. They talk about positive thinking, positive talking. Oh, one of them writes and says the worst thing that ever happened to the human race is to downplay the human God says he's depraved, not me. It's a new creature that we deal with. I said it's a new creature that we deal with. Amen. We, we are faced with the problem of a world, a society broke loose. We have no culture. I said we have no culture. They talk about a counterculture movement. There ain't no culture here. Amen. You take, you can't have culture without religion. You can't have culture without art. All the arts in the museum anymore, never out, not a part of us. Religion is relegated, locked up in a monastery somewhere, in a church. You don't want it on the street. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There ain't no culture. You hear me? I said there's not any culture. Amen. It's a society broke loose. Amen. From the restraints of God and His Word. We must understand, number one, not only our are we the answer to that problem? But we're responsible for that problem being here until the church recognizes that that homosexual spirit on the street is a product of a perverted gospel. When they change the truth of God into a lie, when that liberal pulpit denied the virgin birth, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the work of God through human, then that perversion moved from that pulpit to a physical perversion in America and the society. Amen. We have to recognize not only are we the answer, we must repent. We must repent of our responsibility of the thing being there. We can't just point a finger at a corrupt system. It's always been corrupt. Everything outside of Christ is corrupt. Amen. Everything outside of Christ. Everything outside of Christ is cursed. Amen. I, I have, I have my, some of my friends uh, call me 
I, I, I've heard somebody preach that because I'm of this race, we're cursed. I said, everything outside of Christ is cursed. Ain't nothing in Christ cursed. Nothing. Amen. I don't become selling that lie. Just wake up to this one truth. That whatever's not in Christ is of the devil, ladies and gentlemen. I said, it's of the devil. And we must come to realize it. We, we're facing a problem of upheaval of secular and religious humanism. And I, I, I know you understand the secular, but the religious. That it take our God. Amen. And try to use Him for their own end. Amen. That ego trip that take God and use Him to gain what they want. If you want, I was talking in our in our class this morning about the advent of image advertising. I said the church has come. The reason that you see very little results, real results, out of the media advertising, ladies and gentlemen, that you can't package and sell Christ on that television. To that world, it's grotesque. I said it's grotesque. You paint a picture of that cross. Listen, you paint a picture of that cross. You tell that man you have to die to get in here. Amen. He's not going to buy it. Oh, no. That image advertisement just simply says, I decide what kind of a man Gordon Ritter wants to be, then I make him believe that my product will help him get there. That's where the church is today. What do you want? A Cadillac, then Jesus is the answer. You couldn't sell Jerry Tall by setting a bottle up here, putting that camera on it and said every woman needs it. But if you get a woman walking out there, look like she could throw a bale of hay 30 feet and say, Jerry Tall did this. Jesus ain't sold that way. But that's how they packaged him. Oh, you get that toothy smile and that tuxedo. Amen. The right choreography and the music are going. The big crowd and the clap. And if you want this, get Jesus. Oh, that's religious humanism. Let me tell you. If you want to maybe wind up in Africa, get Jesus. If you want to maybe wind up in India, get Jesus. If you want to sell everything and follow him, get Jesus. Hallelujah. And when you're dead and come alive, you'll discover that's the only way to live. But you don't sell that to the carnal mind. You have to change it. And when it comes in, the only, the only, the only attraction is the cross. That's all. Hallelujah. We're faced with a sexual revolution, including abortion, venereal disease, child pornography, all of this. We face, ladies and gentlemen, as a church, it's out there. It's not in Houston, it's in Beaumont. Amen. It's in Beaumont. We face that problem. You and I, listen, the genetic engineering with questions of creation, life, death, euthanasia, disintegration of monogamy, marriage, family, fatherhood, long-range effects of drug culture, including legal and illegal drugs, crime, emotional distress, immobility, inability to change, cure, control the problem, loss of leadership, spiritually, politically, militarily, role confusion, including sexual deviancy, Jezebel spirit, economic chaos, occult revival, have a new despotism, bureaucracy, which puts restrictive machinery needed to harness a lawless society into a non-elective office. All of this we face. I said, all of this we face. And for the most part, we can crawl under and wait on a rapture, or we can stand up in the name of God and say, we have an answer. We have an answer to that family problem. We have an answer to that drugs. We have an answer to all the problems of society. It all is in having the right or the wrong perspective to look through the eyes of a human and David, David talk about the troubles of your heart or talk about God that stands atop of it all. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and let's worship God. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus, Jesus, don't let a human be lost, don't let a human be lost, oh my God, in this television audience, they're about to leave us, they're so troubled, problems that I've mentioned are insurmountable, and in that, in that lost condition, they're ready to take their life, but Jesus is your answer, God can change your life. Let him do it. Good night. Every head is...